Thank you. Hi, everybody. You can hear me in the back, yeah? I'm thrilled to be here today. As Dr. Searby said, I came, by, uh, came to mentoring two ways. One is genetically through my mother. Um, and the other is um, I, I really um, became a believer in the effectiveness of mentoring to improve diversity and inclusion when I was leading a diversity and inclusion uh, initiative for a publicly traded company. I believed then, and I still believe, that um, diversity and inclusion must be bought in at the top and there must be systemic programs. But I also believe, and in many ways I believe even more strongly, that the real way to affect inclusion in the work environment is through meaningful one-on-one -on -one relationships with people who are different from you in some substantial way. Because there is no better way to make connections and to make change than to, uh, through, as Dr. Morrell said, the friendship networks, right, and really improve that. So I'm super passionate about this topic. Um, and I want to talk to you today about building bridges, because I really do believe that effective mentoring relationships are about building bridges across difference. Um, and so, uh, my promise to you, my commitment to you in our time together today is that you will learn three things. A framework for bridging differences, a model for cultural competency, and some skills to bring back to your mentoring relationships or your mentoring programs to bridge those differences. The truth is that culturally competent people build bridges. They make those connections. And there's three components to building bridges. The first is leaning into difference. The second is learning from difference. And the third is leveraging difference. Leaning into difference, learning from difference, and leveraging difference. So I want to talk first about leaning into difference. Leaning into difference requires two things, taking ownership and accepting responsibility. It is about saying that as a mentor and as a mentee, it is my responsibility to create connection. As a mentor and as a mentee, it is my responsibility to learn and to dig deeper and to figure out what really makes my mentoring partner tick so we can communicate in a way that elevates and deepens the discussion, in a way that accelerates and promotes better, better mentoring results. So it's really about taking that ownership. When we talk to uh, mentoring pairs or mentoring circle participants, and the most likely time that they um, have success is when the mentees say, I finally owned it. I finally owned my own development. I finally owned my own success in the mentoring relationship. And the mentors say, I finally took responsibility to dig deeper for my, men for my mentees. It's really very, very key. I love this quote by Winston Churchill. The price of greatness is responsibility, and this is true in mentoring relationships as well. The price of greatness is taking that ownership and accepting responsibility. So I want to tell you about these guys, um, who I don't really know because these are stock photos, because my obligation to my clients is to protect confidentiality. So what I, do, what I have done is to put together a composite of um, some mentoring uh, pairs that we have worked with, uh, and one in particular, and we're going to call th um, them for this uh, purpose, Doug and Martin. And I want to just grab my notes so I don't miss some key facts. But Doug and Martin you'll hear about throughout the course of my talk today, and I want to introduce you to them. They work for ABC Medical Company, which is a medical, multinational medical device company. Doug has been with the company for about 30 years. He actually started in the manufacturing realm and worked his way up to senior leadership. Very well-respected leader. Great people person. People like Doug, and Doug likes people. It's a, it's a very mutually beneficial relationship. Uh, Martin is a younger uh, gentleman in his 20s. He's uh, Mexican-American. His uh, parents um, uh, immigrated to Mexico when he was in his teens. He leads, he's a line lead in the manufacturing division. So he leads a small team which manufactures the medical devices, and his team loves him. They, they think he's great with, with um, with people, they really motivate him, he always hits his numbers. And though his team loves him, his management doesn't love him so much. Martin is always asking questions, he's always challenging the rules, he's a little bit uncomfortable with what he feels are arbitrary constraints that are on him in the workplace. And he's got some strong ambitions. He's smart, he's motivated, he's personable. He can't figure out why he can't get along with his own management and he can get along so well with his people. And ultimately, he really wants to get out of manufacturing. He's been trying for a while, and he's uh, stuck. 
And what he said is, what he said to us is, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get why I can't get out of manufacturing. So Doug and Martin meet in the mentoring kickoff, and they hit it off really well. Martin loves Doug's leadership. He loves his, pers his personableness. Um, he's a little bit skeptical that this will work. Doug, for his part, loves Martin. What a great, friendly guy. And he can't quite figure out why Martin isn't getting ahead uh, more at ABC. What Martin said initially was, as I said, I don't get it. I don't get why I can't, why I'm doing what, I'm, what I've always been doing and I can't get ahead. And he ultimately said, what, I need to, what we ultimately said to Martin when we coached him is, it's time to adopt a growth mindset. As I mentioned in the pre-conference session, we talked about a growth mindset. Growth mindset is based on the work of Carol Dweck, Dweck excuse me, which is, um, uh, her book is called Mindset. And there are two kinds of mindsets. There's a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. And a fixed mindset says, I know what I'm going to know. Right? I'm going to get what I'm always going to get. I'm going to stop with what I know and use that, try to use that to get ahead. The problem is you don't. The second kind of mindset is a growth mindset, which is this idea that I can continue to learn. I can continue to grow. I can expand my frame of reference and learn new things. And ultimately, it wasn't just Martin who needed to adopt a, a growth mindset, but Doug, too, needed to embrace his growth mindset. And that was essential for both of them to grow. So moving on to learning from difference, the second pillar. There are four essential components to learning from difference. Learning from difference is really about creating awareness. The problem we often find in this stage is that mentoring partners start with trying to learn about each other. The problem we find in the space, I'm going to say it once again because I see some quizzical looks. Did she mean what she wanted is what she said? I did mean what I said. The problem in this space is that mentoring partners start with trying to learn about each other and they skip over learning about themselves. And the preparation, the reflection before even entering into that mentoring relationship where you figure out who you are and what affects how you show up is absolutely critical, absolutely critical to success. I love this quote by the architect Charles Ames. The details are not the details. They make the design. The details are not the details. They make the design. Really important to figure out what are the details that affect the way that you show up. So part two of our heroes, Doug and Martin, six months in, we talk to them again. And I want to sort of title this chapter, What's Getting in the Way? Martin is on a PIP. You know what a PIP is? A performance improvement plan. Though his team loves him, his management has finally just gotten tired of all the questions. Martin's surprised by the PIP. Doug's surprised by the PIP. And while Doug has started to help Martin negotiate some of the terms of the PIP, the next task is really to figure out how do we get here? How do we get to a point where here's somebody who's so beloved by his team, and yet is in such <laughs> deep water with his um, managers? What's influencing the way he shows up? And how can Doug help Martin establish the right goals for himself? And what about Doug's own perspective is preventing him from fully relating to Martin? So, and Martin's, again, still a little skeptical about Doug. So I encourage them to set aside some time to get to know each other. And we used this model, the iceberg model. I love this definition of identity from a very fancy, illustrious source called the Google. Um, <laughs> identity is the fact of being who or what a person is. Identity is the fact of being who or what a person is. So many of you have seen this iceberg model before, I'm sure. If you think about each person, think about yourself as an iceberg, there's only a limited amount above the surface that you see. And we make judgments about what we see above the surface. And what we see about the surface certainly affects what's below the surface and vice versa. What's below the surface is, is obviously much more complex than what's above the surface, right? Things like our values, right? Our uh, motivation, our learning styles, our cultural reference points. Doug and Martin really started to dig deep into what this, what this meant. What were some of the elements that were really affecting how they, show, how they showed up? And the importance of reflecting on their own identities first. They had a great start at the, on that at the mentoring kickoff. They started to get to know each other, but they realized it was time to really dig deeper and go back to that. There was a second and third component 
of identity that was really critical for both of them and critical for all of us. The first is bias, right? We all hold biases. What is a bias? A bias is a preference in favor or against a person or thing, right, that disadvantages another person or thing. Very simple, right? Rudimentary definition. We all hold biases and they affect the way we show up and it's important to bring those biases to the conscious when we can, identify them, and what I say, manage those biases, meaning call them out, test yourself on those biases, and see how that, uh, how that impacts you. In um, Doug's case, there was a second, uh, well, in everybody's case, but particularly here in Doug's case, there was another element that was really at play here, and it's the element of privilege, okay? Whereas bias is something that's an advantage or a disadvantage of another, Privilege is something that is an advantage of yourself, for yourself, an unearned advantage based on a presumed <coughs> sense of belonging. Now, I want to say something about privilege. It ruffles lots of people's feathers. What it doesn't mean is that you haven't earned what you've gotten from working hard. It doesn't mean that you are not deserving of success. But what it does mean is that you have, you have been advantaged through systems where you have a presumed sense of belonging. And through really deep conversations between Doug and Martin, they had some really interesting conversations about privilege. Doug really couldn't understand some of the barriers that Martin was facing. And Martin says to Doug, it's kind of easy for you. Doug, it's easy for me, like I worked 12, 14 hour days for 30 years, easy for me. He said, yeah. He said, everybody looked like you. Everybody, you knew that you could get where you wanted to get in the organization because you could see people at the top who resembled you. I never had that. I never had that. And frankly, I'm not sure I can get there. And examining that, in Doug recognizing his own privilege, he really was able to better relate to others in the organization, not just Martin, and start to become much more of a champion for inclusion, which was his intention all along, but he didn't realize some of his own blocks. Here's the thing. Cultural competency can only grow on a foundation of safety and trust. Um, as I was putting these slides together, I was remembering a story by one of my close friends who lives in a house that's sort of by a wooded forest. <coughs> and uh, there are these birds that are driving them nuts. They're tweeting all the time and they have these high-pitched tweets and they can't quite figure out what's going on with the birds. And she always walks out there, you know, like kind of stomping as she's trying to, to put the kids to bed or whatever. These birds are kind of a nuisance and they just keep tweeting louder. And one day her husband who is not particularly an animal person, by the way, but he walks out very gently into the backyard and he holds up his hand. And what happens? The bird flies onto his hand. I'm amazed when I heard the story. No one had the husband, but I have to tell you, it's a great story. And it reminded me that until that bird felt safe, the bird never felt, the birds never felt safe when my friend was stomping out into the yard, why are you tweeting? of this gentleness and safety, which is really fundamental, he was able to make that connection. Now the birds are still tweeting, so maybe the moral of the story isn't such a good one. But it is, it's important in terms of thinking about, as Dr. Morell said, the relational capital of connection, really important here. So how do they build trust? Here it is. The three most fundamental rules of building trust, I see you, I hear you, and I value you. I see you, I hear you, and I value you. I remember, um, as Dr. Searby said, when I, was pra I practiced law for a number of years, um, and let's just say at the time, the uh, law firm world wasn't the most inclusive uh, environment. Um, still true in some, not so true in others, but I remember right after I had children, I came back to work, after I had my first child, I came back to work, and there was a male partner who was rough, he was rough to everybody. I mean, rough, verbally rough. And at one point I said, you're gonna have to be a little bit gentle with me. I'm just coming back from maternity leave. I, you know, like I'm getting my bearings. And he said, Lisa, I'll never see you as a working mother. And I think what he meant was, I see you just like I see the attorneys who are male or who are women but not working or whatever. But what I thought was, then you don't see me. It had become such a fundamental part of my identity for him to say, I don't see you as, then I, I felt, all of a sudden I felt invisible. All of a sudden I felt invisible. 
So the three most important components to building trust, I see you, I see you, right? Let me put the emphasis on a different syllable. I see you, I hear you, and I value you. Trust cannot be built until those are there. So once once um, Martin, excuse me, once Doug really started to understand and see Martin, and Martin really started to understand and see Doug, the mentoring became so much more effective. And when we talked to Doug, he said, I want to know what motivates Martin. I said, well, let's find out what lights him up. And this is one of my favorite models for what lights you up. It's not a coaching, mo it's not a coaching model. It's not a mentoring model. It's just an effective concept called Native Genius by a woman named Kristen Wheeler. Um, here, and here, here's what worked so well for Doug and Martin. If you look, think about the vertical axis as ability, right, and the horizontal axis as desire. So you can, what, 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 when you think about what lights you up and what motivates you, and you really try to find that native genius, it lies in the intersection of where you are most capable and you are most motivated. And what um, Kristen Wheeler calls that is Milum, with this place where my eyes light up. The place where my eyes light up. And so when you find that native genius as a mentor of your mentee or as a mentee of yourself, the goal setting process becomes so much more meaningful and durable. And that's what Doug and Martin did, is they spent time in this quadrant of native genius. And Doug discovered that Martin loved dealing with people. He loved motivating people. He was really good at it, right? Spent a lot of time there. What didn't he like? He didn't like rules. He didn't like keeping track of stuff. And he was able to empower somebody on his team to take the responsibility of some of the logging Right? Here we are lifting others up in what they're good at so he could focus in his quadrant of native genius and get better results. So let's take this to the next place of leveraging difference. Leveraging difference is about perspective shifting. It's about shifting your perspective. You've taken ownership in uh, leaning into it. You've built awareness in learning from it. And now it's about shifting perspective. Leveraging it requires building competency, and I'll show you a model for that in a moment. It requires providing support, vision, and challenge of your mentoring partner in a way that's meaningful to him or her or them. And it requires expanding the pie. Let's talk about each of those. Another favorite quote of mine, I guess birds are the theme of the day. <laughs> um, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. This is a model um, by um, Milton Bennett from 1986, which is a really powerful model of <laughs> intercultural development. Um, Milton Bennett really found that what cultural competency is, and le let me just take a step back, because I, I don't think I've defined cultural competency yet. Cultural competency is the skill of how we address difference. Cultural competency is the skill of how we address difference. And that he found that there's a continuum in the development of cultural competency, and it all has to do with how you address difference. So let me, let me walk you through the five stages, and then we'll talk a little bit more about them. The first stage of intercultural development is the stage of denial. It's not just a river in Egypt, <laughs> right? Denial actually isn't about denying differences. It's really about missing differences. People who are in denial, or organizations that are in denial, or institutions that are in denial, or mentoring pairs, partners, or circles that are in denial, it's not that they don't see that there's a visible difference. It's that they don't recognize that the differences even make a difference, right? And often this is the case when there is a very homogenous environment, that the organization, the institution, the pairs, the individual is in denial and misses difference. The second phase is polarization. And polarization, you start to see differences. But what happens in polarization is you start to judge differences. So the way I do it is better than the way you do it. right? I prefer your, ori your orientation to the world versus my orientation to the world. That's another kind of polarization. 
I prefer, hmm, this is better. And you're spending time in your head processing the difference from a judgmental standpoint. Now, you're seeing the difference. And I want to be clear that it's developmental. You can't skip steps here. As they say in a very different context, the only way out is through. So in order to get to the end, you have to go through each step. And you can start to see how it's developmental. If you're in denial, your developmental task is to start to see differences and to process those differences. After polarization is this phase of minimization. Again, minimization, you're not necessarily judging the differences, but you're de-emphasizing the differences, right? I see the differences, but they don't really make a difference. And in many ways, this is what so many of us were taught to do. I certainly know as an employment lawyer, I said this, the other, I said this yesterday, as an employment lawyer, I spent 10 years telling people don't talk about that, right? Don't talk about race, don't talk about gender, don't talk about protected, protected classes, because you shouldn't be talking about that in the workplace. And I think the biggest fallacy of that was the, what I talked about before. I don't see you. I don't see you. I don't recognize who you are. I mean, look at our, look at our music, right? Ebony and Ivory, people are the same wherever we go, right? It's not that there's not a shared humanity, right? But there is a, but the way we look at respect Respect differs by, differs by uh, culture, orientation, all of those things. The way we look at what's kind and nice, the way we look at what our ambitions are, the way we look at authority, the way we look at communication, it makes a difference and recognizing that difference is essential to getting to the next step, which is acceptance. Oops, wrong direction, sorry about that. Let me say this before we get there. These first three stages are what's called ethnocentric stages. Ethnocentric stages is when you see difference through your own vantage point, right? How would I process this? How do people like me see difference? How is this difference relative to who I am? When you move to acceptance, you move to an ethno-relative, what they call ethno-relative. The simpler way to say it is with a viewpoint of how other cultures may view things. It's non-evaluative. Again, I think what's interesting here is you go from not seeing difference to judging difference to not seeing dif to minimizing difference. Again, you're seeing difference here, so it's a little bit of a zigzag way. In acceptance, you comprehend difference. You get that differences make a difference. You understand that there's an imperative for inclusion. You understand that the ability to make meaning depends on seeing that difference. Yet you don't yet know how to walk the talk. What do I do about it? What do I do about it? Right? I have a great intention, I have a great awareness, and I'm not yet sure how to implement that. Which takes us to adaptation. Adaptation brings you to what uh, Milton Bennett would call an intercultural mindset, and that's where you can really start to implement the skill of bridging difference, of making that connection, of recognizing the difference, of recognizing where there might be a difference. If you are on that end of the continuum, it does not mean that you know how to kiss, bow, and shake hands in every single culture. People say, oh, you talk about cultural competency. When I go to Tibet, how am I going to, I don't know. <laughs> but what I know is there are lots of differences you need to be aware of and lots of questions you need to be asking so you can figure it out and relate across culture, right? So it, it's very different than, being, um, than having skills to adapt to, to know what happens in each culture. The person in adaptation knows what questions to ask, they know how to operate in different cultures, and they recognize where people may approach differences differently. I, um, I, I love Harvard Business Review. I sort of geek out on it every single time it comes. My family doesn't like it that I lock myself in the <laughs> office and I read a magazine for seven hours, but you know, a girl's got to have some fun, right? Um, <laughs> so uh, the September-October issue, it was fantastic. It is all about curiosity, the business case for curiosity. Um, and they define, I just want to read to you the definition um, from the authors of uh, one of the articles there called From Curious to Competent. The de uh, curiosity is a penchant for seeking new experiences, knowledge, and feedback, and an openness to change. I'm going to say it one more time. Curiosity is a penchant for seeking new experiences, knowledge, and feedback, and an openness to change. And what I love about that article is of all the studies of the strengths of leadership, 
the authors found that the number one trait of success in leadership was the skill of curiosity. The number one trait of, of skills of leaders is the skill of curiosity. Amazing, right? Not what I would have thought, and yet everything that I would have thought based on what I know, right? So what was really cool about this, as Doug was trying to figure out why then, now I understand Martin, I get that he's a really good guy, I get sort of what motivates him, and I'm really curious about why he's not getting ahead. I'm really curious about why he's not getting ahead. So he started, I, I introduced him to the pie model, which I'll show you in a moment. And the pie model says that there's three critical success factors for any leader. Performance, improvement, excuse me, performance, image, and exposure. Performance, image, and exposure. So in a perfect world, what percentage of success should performance take? 100. 100%, 100 right? If it's a perfect world and we're all judged on how we perform, performance should be 100% of the pieces of the pie. But here's the problem. Here's what studies have found. It's not 100% of the pie. It's not even 50% of the pie. It's not even 25% of the pie. Performance accounts for only 10% of success. What's the rest? It's exactly what Dr. Morell was talking about. It's exposure and image. It's exposure and image. Talk about a awakening for Doug in terms of his own privilege. He realized that his exposure in the organization over 30 years, right, had helped contribute to how his performance was viewed and that that was his ladder to success. And in talking to Martin, and in thinking about the organization, which Doug knew very, very well, he realized it wasn't Martin's performance at all that was holding him back. It was his lack of access to networks. It was his lack of social capital. It was, his, it was the way he was perceived because of a lack of understanding of his own cultural differences and his style in asking questions and inquisitiveness because of his view that if his team didn't rise, he didn't rise, so all he spent his time doing was advocating for his team and not advocating for himself. What a transformer. What a transformer. So it took a great mentor to understand that there were other components of critical success, cr other critical components of success in order to help the mentee succeed. And Doug's task was to help Martin gain the exposure, give him feedback on his image, and ultimately, because of his position, Doug was able to influence the organization in the way that they viewed uh, other um, uh, um, employees who may differ from what the represented uh, case was. So how do we shift our perspective in mentoring? How do we get curious? Here are some great questions. I only have 45 minutes, so I could go, we could go a lot deeper and would love to have a deeper discussion on this, but here are five entry points in mentoring relationships to really start to shift your perspective and get curious. Asking yourself, what lens am I looking through? What lens am I looking at this through? Why am I seeing it so differently than you're seeing it? What's impacting the way I look at it? And frankly, what lens are you looking through that's impacting the way you look through it? How might someone else see it? If the opposite of what I believe is true, were true, how might someone else see it, right? If somebody didn't have the foundational knowledge that I have, how might somebody else see it? And really expanding, shifting perspective that way. Asking your mentee, what consequences do you foresee from this action? What other consequences? What other consequences? And really beginning to expand perspective. Here's what it seems like to me. How is it different for you? And not assuming, you know, really getting deeper than assumptions um, and expanding to, to look at difference and to look at different perspectives. And finally, what am I missing? How many times has somebody given you advice, given you counseling, and said, go, go do this and come back without seeking, what am I missing? What are the chances of success of this? What am I missing? So back to our heroes here. 
back to our heroes. So we're nine months in. We're talking to um, Doug and Martin. And uh, Martin has now moved to a different facility. The things had soured enough with his leaders that um, they found another similar position at another facility. And Martin was able to uh, use some of the um, learnings that he'd had in his mentoring relationship to be successful there. Again, we're talking about exposure, right? There's, there's the link um, for exposure. He was um, working his way to get off the performance improvement plan. And he said to us, I have so far to go, but I feel now like it's on me. I have so far to go, but I feel now like it's on me. Notice the difference from the beginning where he said, I don't get it. I'm not sure I'm going to get out of here. I have so far to go, but I feel now like it's on me. Doug's become a resource. Um, and, uh, and, and what um, Martin said is, I'm building allies. I want to be out of manufacturing and I understand the skills I need to develop to get there. I know what it's going to take. It's on me. I got the knowledge. Now I got to go do it. Having Doug as an ally was huge. Doug, for his part, was working with the leaders. Uh, well, initially, I should say, when Doug started to, had some questions about whether he could help Martin, he said, maybe I'll just reach out to the leaders in manufacturing and see what I can do. And this is when I said to him, not yet. Go get curious first. Go get curious first. Once they had developed that rapport, he started to work internally to see some of the things that were holding back some of these manufacturing uh, employees and um, was able to in influence the resetting of some of the rules and procedures. Not because of Martin, not, not just as they related to Martin, but in terms of the whole organization. Talk about the mutuality and the reciprocity of mentoring. You see how this deepening of the relationship has caused Doug to be so much more of an effective leader because he can really start to see and understand differences. He said, I see that I'd always, ha I'd always thought the same culture was throughout the company. I learned I need to check in more and make sure everyone's included. I have a role in this. I have a role in this. He said it was critical to help aligning new goals with uh, uh, Martin's native genius. Uh, and it was really important for them in moving forward. And I, have I gone the wrong direction here? No. So here's our three pillars. Leaning into it, learning from it, and leveraging it. Leaning into it, learning from it, and leveraging it. Thank you. <laughs> what questions do you have? Oh, what a great question. Is curiosity a state or a trait? Yes. I think curiosity is a state and a trait, right? I think curiosity is a way of being. Um, I think curiosity is a characteristic that helps you dig deeper. It's sort of like it's a noun and a verb, right? Um, so it's a fantastic question. Thank you. The radio broadcaster who said there's always more to the story, Paul Harvey, used to say there's always more to the story, right? You don't know what you don't know. And once you learn that you don't know what you don't know, curiosity follows automatically. Because I want to know, <laughs> right? So starting to ask those questions. So I think it's taught, and I also think it's felt. So the question is, what are my thoughts about emotional intelligence as a trait that leads to more? I think emotional intelligence is incredibly important. Certainly, this is not the end of what's important from a leader. Emotional intelligence is about awareness. Emotional intelligence is about having a heightened sense of reading things. It's like you read the words and the music and the harmony and the melody all at once. That's what emotional intelligence is really all about. And so it's critical. And that's why it's so important. You know, we have a lot of um, international clients. And they say, we'll just do phone mentoring by phone. Okay? And I say, that's like option number five. <laughs> First is always best in person, but we live in a global world and you can't always do that. Skype and Zoom and FaceTime are amazing tools because you really can only exercise emotional intelligence when you're reading body language and the furrow in the brow and the pause and the, whether you're someone's leaning in or leaning back. And really having that awareness is really, really key. So it's another super important uh, component of awareness. Great question. Uh, how do you help people? The question for those who couldn't hear is how do you help people progress? I'm just going to, um, I hope this doesn't give you remote control nausea, but let's look here for a second. Um, 
it is, it is absolutely developmental. So if somebody is stuck in denial, that means they're not seeing differences. So the opportunity is then present differences to people, right? Ha teach about learning style. If, if, if for some reason, I mean, I, ask, I think it's a big mistake to miss the fundamental visible differences. We shy away from them and it's important. Gender's important, race, ethnicity, all of those things are important to recognize. But sometimes people don't feel safety in talking about those yet. By the way, that's a privilege, just to point that out. But by the way, that's a privilege. But if you want to get and meet somebody where they are, you start to point out differences. How do you learn? Here's how I learn. Why did you choose English? I love math. I mean, it's that, it's that kind of simple. Why do I love those things, right? How do you get jazzed to, to, uh, to get up every day, right? Do you press the snooze five times or are you, right? I mean, all of those little mini differences that make a difference in how you show up in the day are something that you present to somebody who's in denial so that they can start to see those differences and evaluate them. You don't want to have them stop at evaluation, right? But you got to go through in order to get out. Great question. Other questions? Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of the conference.